Okay, that's it. We're recording. Let's go ahead and do this. And I guess I start with sharing my screen right over here. Cool. Um, let me make this a little bigger. So welcome everyone, and it's call number 002, Pricing WordPress Services. Uh, this is a topic that I'm super excited about. Like, and just to like give you a reason why I'm really excited about this topic is I remember my first paying job. Like I was in Co-Academy, I was trying to learn HTML, CSS, and all this stuff. And after like six months of grinding it out in Co-Academy, I got my first job with a client and I built, it was like over 24 pages of just custom HTML, CSS and JavaScript on Bootstrap. I didn't even, I didn't even know what WordPress was then. And uh, I did it for like $240. And that was my very first job. And uh, you know, that's not that much money for a custom made website in two months worth of work. So since this whole journey of like starting, you know, it's been constantly going up, going up, going up. Uh, real quick, before we like go ahead and start this off, uh, you know, I wanted to like, uh, I know these calls are new and I kind of just wanted to like introduce these calls also because I feel like, you know, like I've been in some calls like this and I've been in some other calls and just want to kind of give context and like let everyone know what to expect in these calls. Now these calls, I'm looking at a more of like a meetup style. See, I do meetups around the area for like WordPress and for other, you know, like events and groups. And I do it because I enjoy it. You know, I like working with other people with the same passion and doing the same things that I do. And I like sometimes facilitating these groups as well. And so I kind of look at these video calls as sort of like a meetup, more of like than like a webinar, you know, like I just really want to like, get that out there. Like this isn't like some marketing or promotional thing. This, you know, the reason why I created this group and I put this group together is, you know, um, I started doing groups like this about a year ago and it has changed everything for the way that I've been doing my business. It has been such a huge help because when I started learning uh, how to build websites, like I started learning how to build websites. I started learning how to do CSS, how to do WordPress. The last thing that I learned how to do was the business side. How do you deal with clients? You know, how do you get paid right for the work that you do? How do you move up your prices? You know, these were the very last things that I learned. And I really feel like if I were to learn them in the beginning, like I could have saved myself so much headache, a lot of stress and a lot of costly uh, mistakes. And I'm really hoping like this group can do that for other people. Like I hope it could just help out, you know, so that way we could put the focus on learning the business side, uh, providing websites as a service. And uh, I hope that others could also, you know, prevent making all those costly mistakes. And, you know, another thing too is I'm still learning and I find doing stuff like this, you know, like I'm actually learning from it as well. So it's like, I wanna share what I've learned. I wanna share what's working for me, but I'm also learning at the same time. And it's a huge help for me and my growth. And uh, so with these calls, what I'm looking to do is, you know, I'm really hoping that these are like, uh, like they're like, like, uh, uh, like a meetup style, you know, like where others are involved in it. You know, I really want other people to get active in it, to answer questions, uh, to spark the conversations. And also I'm really hoping that others will step up and start running their own meetings as well. You know, I don't want to do every single one of these calls. I want to go ahead and like open this up because you know, I really feel like this community could teach each other. And that's the whole point of it. So, you know, uh, if you're just seeing this videos, you're wondering what they're all about, you know, that's it right there. That's what we're hoping to get out of it. And I'm open to all suggestions. You know, anybody in the group could DM me. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to respond to you because I really want this to work. So feel free to contact me anytime on it. All right. So. Does anybody have any questions or anything before we start getting into the slide? Anything? All right. Cool. Well, that was my spiel. Let's go ahead and move on to while we're here. And that's, uh, let me see. I'll just go ahead and start sharing the slide. 
All right, and it's gonna be uh, our second call, Price and WordPress Services. So, you know, like I said in the beginning, this was probably one of the last things I learned. I, I had no idea when I came into this, how do you charge somebody for a website? Like, what basis do I go off of? Do I go off of how much time it's gonna take? You know, and the thing is like, especially when I'm new or even today, sometimes I get projects, uh, clients are uh, uh, requesting things and I really can't tell how long it's gonna take. So how to figure out a price and how to go ahead and charge for my services. So part one, we're just gonna talk about charging clients. Now there's two most common ways of charging clients. One of them is gonna be charging by the hour and the other one is gonna be charging by the project. Now I'm not gonna say one is better than the other. I'm not gonna say one is right, one is wrong, because I really feel like either one could work. And I think like, uh, with our different styles of uh, being web designers and developers, some work better hourly and some work better, you know, charging by the project. You know, like I really just strongly advise that one thing is figure out what works best for you. Uh, from my experience, I still do both, you know, right now. I do both of them at the same time. And it all depends, you know. Uh, I went back and forth and I've tried out a lot of different things and I figured out what works best for me. So let's go ahead and start with charging by the hour. And now the pros for charging by the hour. So the first one is, um, it's good if your project demands perfection, close attention to detail. So, you know, if you got a project and you know, like, you can't really tell the scope of it, you know it's gonna, that's gonna be ongoing, you know that it's gonna take a lot of attention to detail, you know, charging by the hour might save you from, you know, giving a quote and then the job being way bigger than what it was. You know, one of, one of my mistakes that I've fallen into was I think a job will take two weeks, but then it ends up taking two months. And so, you know, if I really look at the time I spent, you know, like if I combine the hours and divide that into uh, the money I made on it, you know, it's only like a few dollars an hour right there. So if you see that maybe a job is going to just have a lot of detail to it and there's so many different elements to it, then maybe breaking it down or charging it by the hour could help you and save you from, you know, from losing out and spending too much time. Now, the second one is if the client wants to be hands-on and make several revisions. Uh, this happens. I've had a client come in and just tell me, like, hey, I just want you to know I want to be in the process the whole way. Now, it's up to you if you want to work with the client like that. Uh, I've done it before. I remember the first time I worked with a client like that. Um, it wasn't like he was bad. He really just wanted to know what it was like. He just, like, he just wanted to be involved with the whole thing. And I gave him a price, and that job went off forever. It did not stop because he was in it the whole time. You know, and I know if I were to charge by the hour on that, you know, the client would have been more respectful of my time. So the third one, it's also good to avoid negotiations with prices. There's a set price on it. You know, like whatever your hourly rate is, that's your hourly rate. There's no like going back and forth trying to find out, you know, like trying to reduce the scope or trying to fit it into the budget. That's just the cost. So it makes it a little bit easier when dealing with money. If it's hard for you to talk about money with a client, you know, this can simplify it. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, any questions right now about charging by the hour for the pros? All right, we'll keep going. So the cons. Now, the number one, this is my biggest con. And the reason I don't like to use it a lot of the times is because if you're good and fast at what you do, you get penalized. What that means is if you're being efficient and if you could do the job like in half the time, most others can do it, you're actually losing money on it. And it really doesn't make sense because if you're really good and if you've you know, mastered your craft if you're very competent, you got close attention to detail, you got your processes all in place, 
which allows you to do the job super fast, you know, you should get paid for that. So with this, you know, that's one of the biggest cons I, I see with charging hourly is being penalized for being good. The second one is that, you know, the actual work may be more than the estimated work. And this can surprise clients. Uh, we just happened to this, this just happened to us recently where, you know, the client gave us a list of tasks. They looked very simple. We thought it would take about, you know, 10 to 15 hours but now we're in over 40 hours and that brings a budget up, you know, more than double what the client thought. So, you know, that could surprise a client right there. And then the client number three, they might not understand the difference between high hourly rates and uh, low hourly rates. Oh, and the overall cost. So, you might get a little bit of confusion with clients, you know, they might want to get both and they might not understand it, you know? Um, okay. <laughs> so first off, I put this up really quick right here. Just a little uh, disclaimer. Uh, just kind of got to go back and thought on it. So, you know, a client might go on Fiverr and they might see somebody selling their services for $8 an hour. And then you might tell them $50 an hour. And that, that puts you in a position where you got to discuss with the client and you got to try to sell yourself all of a sudden. Why do you, why are you worth more than that other person is charging, you know, a quarter of what you're charging. So it puts you in the position right there. So that's one of the other cons. Okay, so now if you are going to go through, though, with charging by the hour and doing hourly prices, definitely need the right time tracking tools. Now, I've done this before when I started off, and I did not use these tools because, you know, one, I didn't want to pay for them. Uh, two, it was just like I was already so busy that it took that little bit extra time and effort to, like, be consistent with the time tracking tools, but everything was messy. And then I did switch over to using these tools and it was a complete game changer. Everything becomes organized. It becomes actually more faster and efficient when billing the clients. So there are a couple of different options right here and all this right here, I'll be giving this slide out. So, you know, uh, everyone will get this PDF so you could use it and find the links right here. But like one of them would be like toggle. Um, I'm not going to go into all these right here, but I do have to say that this one right here, um, on the paid option, the Get Harvest, that's the one I've been using now for two years and I absolutely love this program right here, this platform. It makes my job so much easier and my team as well. Like not only do I charge the time and keep track of all the time and invoices with clients, but so does my team. And so that's what charging by the hour. Now charging by the project, this is a complete different way right here. This one is given one price for one job. Now the pros for this one right here is great if you're fast. If you're fast, you're efficient, and you got some experience, it, this is the way to go right here. Another one is the, if the client has a firm budget. So let's say the client got $4,000 to spend, you know exactly what you can do and what you can work with with the $4,000. You could give them a scope. You could say, okay, we could do A, B, and C for you within this budget, and then you could commit to it. And uh, number three, if you want to focus on getting paid for the results instead of the time spent. So, you know, one thing about charging by the hour that I find in my own experience is I keep too much time on the clock. And personally, I don't like working, looking at the clock. I don't like the time being the factor, you know, that's always like kind of like a little pressure that's right behind me where I'm constantly looking at the time. Like, oh my God, the client only has this amount of money. If I do too much, the client's going to get upset, you know? So I really want to just focus on the end results. I want to see what we could make at the end, what we could do, how to make this project and this website do good for the client. How can we help the client's business? And by taking the time off the table for me and just taking it out of the equation and just focusing on the results and the value that I could give and how I could help out the client keeps me in the zone.
It keeps me focused on just, you know, just the results on delivering. And then uh, the fourth one is you don't want to limit your earning potential. You know, when you do it by the hour, you're stuck at that price. And uh, we're going to go more into that uh, uh, in the next way to charge. But basically, you know, uh, basically, um, you give yourself an hourly rate, that's your hourly rate. You know, that's it. You're kind of capped off and you're stuck until you raise that hourly rate. All right, so the cons for this right here. So the cons for doing for the proposals, uh, one of the cons will be if the client shows signs of making many changes. If you see this client might be making changes, you know, doing, it, it could open it up to scope creep. Uh, the other one is if the client is not clear of what they want or if they're just testing out different options. Uh, if you got a client that, you know, is just talking about like, well, I want to see how this one works. Can we try this one and this one? You know, it's like you can't really give an overall scope for that right there. Where charging by the hour might do better because it'll make the client respect the time more. And then if you want a full control over the scope of work. Uh, whenever you're charging by the project, it's always going to open up to the scope, open up for scope creep. And it's going to open up to doing more. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure many people here are the same as me. I always do more than what I say I'm going to do. I always do. I, there's never been a project where I haven't done more than what I said I was going to do just because I knew it needed it, just because I knew what would help. You know, so if we got a project in full, we say we're going to build this for you, I'm always going to do extra. But, you know, if your style is you just want to be super technical, you just want to just get this one, this one, this one, and you just want to do it by the book, then, you know, you don't have that full control. Now, the last one right here, and this is where I want to open up some discussion right here, and it's kind of like what I was talking about, you know, uh, not being limited in, in, in the cons of charging by the project is when you charge by the client. And one of the questions I want to ask you all is, should prices be different for larger clients? You know, would you charge the same price for a 15 page website to a client that has a small store, small little pop and mom and pop, and compare that to the same size website for a multi-million dollar company? So if you have two clients right here, you got one, here's your mom and pop right here. You know their budget's small, their, their, their budget's tight. You know, they don't have that much to invest and a website isn't really going to impact their business as much as you got this other company over here that's been around for years. They're a large chain. They got tons of money. They got CEOs. They got all this, you know, marketing and a website for them will make a huge impact. Now, if both the websites are the same, 15 pages each, same exact length of time, you know, should these be the same price? Would the bigger client pay more? And with that, I want to open up discussion on that one. So does anybody have any thoughts on that? Lots, but I want other people to talk first. <laughs> okay, cool. My throat was getting dry, so I have to take a break anyways. Uh, hi Jeff, how are you all? Sorry, I I am a little late to this uh, to this call, but I made it as quickly as I can. How are you all? Oh, Doing good, well? man. See, glad to see you here. Uh, glad to see you as well. Hey, Lauren. Hope you are doing well. Hello, Christopher. Yeah, you too. Okay. Um. So I just heard the last line because I was facing some technical issues with my computer, but now it's okay. So, um. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you asked that if you will charge the same amount to a multi-million dollar company than a small store for the same website, correct? That's the question, that? yes. Okay, so I would like to put my thoughts in and uh, about this, you know, um, I was thinking about it. Um, I feel that you should always understand that what is the budget of the customer, you know, because I understand that you are working the same thing and giving the same output, but as we always talk about, it's more about the results, the end results, rather than how much time you put into it. If there is a company which is a very small scale startup company and they want 
uh, website from me and I feel that this is under my budget and this is something I can deliver um, in that certain budget which they assign. So I will go ahead and do it. But at the same time, not out of greed for money, but understanding if person has a different budget for that and they are willing to pay. So then I feel it's a good idea to not, um, you know, uh, underprice yourself because you know that they have potential. Um, not saying that you, you know, snatch as many dollars as possible. No, obviously I'm sure there would be a certain limit to it, right? Um, if they say we will pay you $2,000 and I know that maybe it's just a $600 um, dollars job. So I will not charge straight up all their budget, but I would still go and see what's the best quotable price. And obviously it can be more than a small startup. That's what I feel about it. But I would love to know the views of everyone involved here. Yeah. Oh, that's some good points right there. Really good points. Lauren, what you got on that? Now you're on the spot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm trying to get my guys to, to share. Um, absolutely, you charge more depending on the client because the risk uh, for failure, I would argue, is higher. So if you're making a website for Domino's Pizza versus, you know, a mom and pop pizza shop, the risk of the Domino's Pizza website is significantly more than just the mom and pop one. They could lose a lot more money. Um, and it doesn't really matter what service you're providing because it's the value that you're providing to that customer. Indeed. Right. Because Domino's, they have more chance of losing money, but they also have much more chance of making money. They could make $2 billion off of your website where that mom and pop could never. So it's more of matching the potential value that you're bringing to them rather than just the hours served is my opinion. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. You know, like I didn't even think about this when I started off, like it, did, it wasn't even something in my mind, you know, like it didn't matter. I, all I looked at always was how big was the website, but it wasn't about what is that website going to do for that business? You know, a smaller business, it's not going to bring as much in, but like I said, like Domino's Pizza, you know, we're, we're creating something that's going to make a whole lot of money for them. You know, and that's the value right there. And then the risk as well. There's a lot more risk involved and there's a lot more that goes into it too, because even though the website might be 15 pages, if you're going to do a website for a bigger client, you're going to put a lot more into it. You're going to put a lot more strategy, thought, you know, research into it, a lot more meetings, discovery, it goes deeper, you know, than just the website right there. And the reason why I want to bring this up is exactly because of that, you know, I wanted to spark this thought. I wanted to get this out there and like plant that seed in other people's minds because when it got planted inside my mind, it changed it, you know. So now when I'm opening a call with a client, when a client, a potential client comes to me, and we sit down and we go through our first talks and our discovery, I'm trying to figure out how big are they? How big of an impact can I make on them? You know, and, and you're right, so it's, it's not about how much money I can get out of them. It's not a greed factor at all that's inside there. You know, it's a genuine, you know, like genuine part of business and honest part of business as well, you know. And I also had to get away from from my old ideals and my old thoughts because you know like I felt like I would be dishonest by uh, same yeah. job I did and True. you know that that's just because I didn't grow up with a business mind you know I think people that went to school for business you know have that business way of thinking you know they've already rooted out those old, those kind of thoughts right there uh, yes um, I just want to put a point here Jeff I totally um, feel you what you are saying because uh, as we discussed last time this is my initial steps of this building business i have made like four or five websites so this mind tricks you into thinking that you are being dishonest because you know you charge less for the last client but now why more you know why are you greedy for money is the question which your mind tricks you into but 
at the same time, I realized that if you have to slowly build your business, it's not about taking all money you can on the table, but obviously how much of an impact, as you said, and as Lauren said, if you are doing something for Domino's, you quote a price as per their brand. What are they as a brand? And if you are quoting a website for someone else, you quote them as per them. So that's, I, I completely agree with you. This is um, one thing which I planted a seed as well. And talks like this with all of you people experienced and not so experienced, but just the share of mindset kind of helps you to grow stronger on these ideas, you know, and then it's not the same problem anymore. So thank you for sharing this with me. I really appreciate it. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I love hearing that. You know, I love hearing that because, you know, this is really what I'm hoping right here. You know, like, I, I, I feel like a lot of, a lot of us are good people and that we just want to help. You know, and especially, you know, when we're learning to do something on our own and just want to go out and genuinely help. And I feel like, you know, when you're coming from a good place in the heart is good, you know, like you could do so much more for the client, but then I could also do harm to myself. If that makes any sense, like I could penalize myself because I just want to do good. And, you know, I, I kind of, I, let me see how to word it right. You know, like. I put the client's business ahead of mine. And that was one of my biggest problems starting off. And that's why I always undercharged my service is because I cared about their business so much. And I wanted them, I wanted to really give them, I, I, I wanted to hook them up. I wanted them to be so happy. I wanted them to have, you know, the best I could possibly give them. And I did it at a cost to myself. And I really like hope like these kind of discussions could show we could still give the best of the clients, but also, you know, what's best for the mutual relationship. I also found that while we're doing this, let me see, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to like open, like search for the right words. I found that once I started to think a bit differently, and started to look at things and like ask these questions and like really look at like, say like asking the client like the size of their budget, how, you know, we started having more professional business conversations. And when we started having more, oh, your audio's off. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at videos. I'm still trying to get used to this whole Zoom thing and talking while I got pictures in front of me. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, mate. <laughs> it's all right it's all right it's a it little... was a little distra disturbance for you but my wi-fi wasn't working so i was setting something in the background but thank you <laughs> it's all good look it's been a long week for me many hours yeah. coming in so i might i might sidetrack from here or there you know yeah. so all right cool anyways let's go ahead and move on uh now that was the first part and we're going over let me go ahead and open up my screen share you know, just the basics. And what we're doing in this call is we're kind of just touching on the basics. You know, everything we're discussing in here right now, I feel we could take a deep dive into later on. Uh, you know, because there's a lot of different parts and steps um, about how to price your service and how to charge a client. So, you know, the first one we went through was, you know, how we could charge either go by hourly or price them by the project, uh, given a full mm -hmm. cost for the scope of work. Now let's talk about what we do with the job and how we move forward with it and best practices. So the next part, we're gonna go into making contracts. Now we're not gonna go too deep into this because I really feel like we can have a call strictly on making contracts because uh, contracts are just so important. And this is something that is easy to get stuck in and also overlook. And I'll have to confess with everybody right now I could tell you my first year, I didn't do any contracts. I, like, I was just so happy to get the work. And I also had this weird thing inside me that I felt like if I were to present a big contract to a client, it might scare them away. And I was so scared of scaring clients away. I had that fear that I didn't even write a contract. And, you know, definitely got to get over the fear because that's wrong, you know, because 
true thing is, and I guess what I was trying to say where I fell off, you know, just, just before was, it was that old way of thinking that I had where I was so busy trying to please a client and not lose him and have that fear of losing the client that when I started changing my thinking and making, you know, being more professional, that clients actually appreciated that a lot more. Providing contracts to clients that are detailed, that are full, that aren't just one little page. Like our contracts are about four pages long for each project and it doesn't matter the size of the project. It's full out contracts and I find that clients are more appreciative of that. And we even discuss the contracts when we go through it. You know, they know that they're working with somebody that's professional when we do that. And I think it gives them more of a sense of, of you know, security working with somebody that does that. So, you know, first off in the contracts, uh, we're gonna go over when a client should sign a contract, uh, what to include in the contract, uh, non-disclosure agreements, and what to do if a client breaks a contract. Whenever you're making a contract, you have to have a few things inside there, for sure on all contracts. You know, one of them is it should always be signed before the work gets, begins. You know, you should never start a job until that contract is signed. Some clients are hesitant to sign it. Some clients will pay you, they'll pay the deposit. And I get that where they'll go ahead and pay the deposit, but then they don't sign the contract or they just get busy and it takes forever to get the contract signed. And the reason why I make sure we get contracts signed before the project is we need to have an understanding. You know, the client needs to understand exactly what they're going to get out of this project. You know, they need to understand we need a set of expectations. They need to know the scope. We need to discuss it. So what I do is when a client starts to just, just, just to, you know, like avoid signing the contract, I set up a call with them. I tell them we could start your project, but let's first discuss this contract. See, you know, if you have any questions. Do we need to amend anything? Does anything needs to be added in there? Let's have a quick call, review it, and go over it. And after that, usually they always just sign it right after. And they, they, they also appreciate it. I get good feedback every single time after I do that. And they say, wow, I didn't even think about that. You know, I'm really glad we went over that. Now we know what's going to happen with our project. Next one is making sure the client understands and agrees, especially the scope of work timeline payment process and the responsibilities you know that's another th like i like to have a discussion with the clients i don't just send them a contract and say here sign this will begin we need to know that you read it you understand it are there questions especially the scope of work you know that seo that sow is so important you know like if they need to add more work to it this is the time because later on when, you know, clients start to ask for more or they start to deviate from what we agreed on, you know, this is where we bring it back to. And if you have that conversation, you know, you are upfront, it's clear, you have the call, you have the conversation, you review it together, you know, it makes it so much easier when you have to go back to the contract and to the agreement, you know, where if you don't have this, well, I really should have brought some water with me. I wasn't expecting my throat to get so dry, but you have to excuse me real quick. When you just have a client sign it, and this is just coming from my experience. When I have a client to sign the contract and just send it to them, they sign it and we don't discuss it. You know, there's nothing, there's no talk about it. Uh, and they start to deviate from the agreement, throwing the contract back in the face, they don't understand. And they, uh, they, uh, they would come back to me and be like, oh, I didn't know about that before the job. I wish I would have known. So I find to avoid that pitfall right there is to have that conversation, have that call with it. Trust me, they are going to appreciate that call right there. And it's also going to position yourself in a more professional way right there. Uh, don't be worried like I was about you know, the client being bothered, the client might wanting to, you know, change their mind. I, I don't worry about that right there. The end results are always positive for this. And then the last one would be non-disclosures. Uh, they should also be signed at the beginning. Now, uh, in case if you're doing work with other people as well, like 
we hire designers, we hire developers, we have other people work with us, we have other people that do like SEO, you know, we collaborate with other people, we do non-disclosures with them. So we always have non-disclosures with everyone that we work with. And it's pretty easy doing non-disclosures because you just get a template. You have one template and then it's easy to go. So if you're going to like work on a project but you want somebody else to help you, definitely get non-disclosures. You gotta protect the client, you gotta protect yourself. Always protect your client. So what you wanna make sure to include inside every contract is the SOW, the scope of work. Uh, the way that I've done it is I break it down step by step. I'm very clear. I don't just say we're gonna make a website that's five pages. I say exactly what those pages are gonna be, what's gonna be included in those pages. <clears throat> you know, is there a blog, is there anything else? Payment details. So I break down the payments as well. Uh, you want to be able to have exactly when the first payment is, if you got multiple payments, and then a, <coughs> a final payment date. You see, one of the things about making these long, these videos, I can't take a break. <laughs> <coughs> I can't believe we're videotaping this too. Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. So I make sure there's always a final payment date. And I make that clear. The final payment is due by this date. This prevents it <coughs> from clients that just want to take off. Has anybody had a job where the job was supposed to take one month and now it's six months because a client stopped giving work or you know, didn't get back copy, they disappeared, they got busy, and now you're stuck and where's your payment at? And that's frustrating. That's very difficult to deal with. Putting a final date on there and making that date clear and even discussing it with them could go ahead and solve that. A timeline. So we want to be able to give a timeline exactly what we're going to do. So say we're going to uh, our, our research process, you know, week one, we're going to do research. We're going to do, you know, set up. Week two, we're going to do design. Week Three, we're going to do development. Week four, development. Week five, testing. We give an exact timeline on everything. Another thing, too, we do on the timeline is not just our timeline, but the client's timeline. You know, they need to have a timeline as well. When are they going to get feedback? When are we going to get copy and images? One of the things we have in our contract is a client has 10 days to give us feedback. If they don't give us feedback within 10 days, the job is done is canceled out, final payments are due, and we have to start all over when they're ready. Uh, we, you know, like, the reason it, of this is, and I'm sure a lot of, like, a lot, of, I'm sure a lot of you have multiple jobs going on at once. You know, you might have two jobs going on, then you got this one job going on. You're trying to balance all these uh, clients together. These two clients and these two projects are going well, they're on schedule. This one should be finished so you can start a new job but now this client disappears or they don't want to give a copy. They keep, you know, they take forever to respond. So now you got a new job that starts off and then this client jumps back in and now you're working double time, you're working weekends. The new job you got is starting to suffer because the old job is now coming back in and taking place and you just want to get it finished. But it just keeps, you know, like it just fell off track and now it messes up everything. It disrupts the flow. So that's why it's really important to make sure there's a clear timeline for you and your client. And what happens if that timeline is broken? Uh, make sure you have, you know, defined deliverables of the client's responsibilities. Uh, a portfolio clause. I learned to add this into all of ours as well. We have inside our contracts that we are allowed to show this project in our portfolio. I don't ask a client beforehand, you know, I don't build a job and say, hey, it was great working with you. Can we throw this in our portfolio? It's part of the deal. You know, part of the deal is we get to add this in our portfolio. <coughs> and if the client for some reason decides they do not want us showing this in our portfolio, uh, that's fine, but our price will probably go up right there. You know, the reason is 
I put a lot of work into all of our projects. A portfolio is very important for a web designer and developer. It's part of how we grow our businesses. So by them not wanting to show the portfolio, it makes it harder for us to take it to the next step and to grow my business. <clears throat> uh, next one's intellectual property. Uh, this one I make really clear. When we start the work, we own everything. <clears throat> we own the work that we've done. We, we own it all until that final payment comes through. You know, so, you know, sometimes a job goes sideways. Sometimes, you know, it just happens where it doesn't work out. And you want to make it clear that, you know, your work is your work until it's paid for. If there's a final payment out there, you know, that website that I just built is not yours. You might have paid me, you know, $3,000 for it, but there's still $1,000 owed. And until that final payment comes through, you know, you don't own it yet. You own it only after you fully paid it. You know, it's, it's kind of like a car. If you buy a car and you're paying monthly payments on it, you don't own it until that final payment comes in. You don't pay that final payment. You know, like the, the, the dealership's going to come back and take back their property. And we need to protect ourselves as well from that. Uh, and then the, the last one's going to be the cancellation and refund policy. And basically, there's no refunds, you know, that that's it, you know, I mean, you, you know, you could play that one by ear, but make sure to add it in there. It happens. Clients will cancel, you know, uh, so just make sure to add that in there. And I put that in there because it happened to us once and we did not have that inside our contract. If we had that in the contract, it would have made things so much easier with dealing with that situation. So what to do, you know, what happens if a client breaks a contract? Usually when contracts are broken, the first one, which is the most common, is scope creep. And I think everybody deals with this. This, I, Actually, my first two years, I don't remember getting one job that did not have scope creep. You know, every single job, I think, especially as a new developer, new designer, as you're learning how to manage clients and manage projects, you're going to get scope creep. It's going to happen. And that's when the client comes in with the constant changes, you know? That's when you get a job to build five pages, a five page website, and now it's a 12 page website because the client keeps wanting changes. Uh, another one is gonna be a delay in the content and images. Uh, that's very common right there. And then also the lack of communication. When you know you finish the site or you finish you know, ABC, you send it to the client for review, and then you're not getting that review coming back. And then the last one, you know, when the client just outright disappears, when they don't show up. So, you know, what to do when a client breaks a contract. And, uh, you know, I wish I had a simple answer for this. It's not that easy, though, you know, because I know from my experience, all of our clients are remote. So it's not like I could just go to court and sue them. And we never wanted to get to that point. You know, uh, what I've done when a client starts to break the contract, I always bring the contract back to them. I always try to bring the agreement back to them and try to work it out with them. And, and luckily, it's never come to the point where, you know, where we had to go to court or we had to hire uh, legal, uh, uh, legal help on it. It's come close just once. But, you know, luckily, it hasn't come to this. Um, you know, I, I, think, oh, I think when you get the bigger projects, maybe that's when you might need legal help. I've never had that problem. But, <clears throat> all right, I'm kind of trailing off right there. I'm sorry about that. Because the answer is, I really don't know what to do if a client breaks a contract. You know, that's the truth. If a client breaks Can a I contract ask? and wants to run away, wants to disappear and not pay the final payment, you know, I mean, you only left with two options, really, you know, like either take the loss or try to take legal action. My experience dealing with this and trying to, you know, dealing with these four issues right here, I've learned to get better in discovery with client. I learned to get better in my communication with the client. That, that's my experience. So, you know, I think if I have any answer to like what to do if a client breaks a contract, what worked for me is learning how to communicate better with the client. Because usually when a 
problem happens down the line is because I didn't communicate clearly with the client. We didn't go big enough into the discovery session in the beginning, or we never should have hired that client in the first place because they had the red flags and they showed that they were not right for us. So that's the only answer I got. I would love to hear others' experiences. I'm sure many people have experiences on what they've done with the client when they did not come through and when the contract was broken. Real quick, let's wrap up the contracts. Uh, I got some links right here, some resources on where to get contracts. Uh, we use electronic signatures. It makes it super easy. Only thing I could think of is make it as easy as possible. Find an easy way that works for you to get a client to sign it. Uh, and I'll go ahead and add this too to a PDF and share with everyone. So let's go ahead and take a break right now and go into a Q&A. I can ask the first question, though you should get a drink first. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. It's like <laughs> <laughs> you're dying over there. Like I pause it, you know. I can't stop and pause. It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have our own system for a billing timeline. I'm curious on what you or other people here do for like uh, billing terms. 50 50, 100 percent upfront. We do 50, 25, 25. What do you do, Jeff? Uh, oh, go ahead, Rajav. No, no, you go ahead. If you're saying something, I can speak after you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do, uh, it depends on the size of the project. If it's under $3,000, we do 50, 50. If it's over 3,000, then we start to break down into milestones. But uh, we're going to be changing and revising that because uh, you know, I recently just hired a business coach and I was told that I have to stop that. I was told to stop the 50-50 and start breaking down into milestones so we're never left hanging on to so much money, you know, even if it's a smaller project. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea, man. Um, so as of now, um, as of I have had no contracts because... Again, um, still learning in the learning stages, but maybe after the today's call, I'm gonna go through the resources for the upcoming clients to make a contract. And till now, Lauren and uh, Jeff and Christopher, uh, what I was doing personally is to break it into parts, like some part at the beginning, like uh, assurance amount, and then something in the middle, like when half of the website is done, for example, if it's a five page website when two to three pages are done then you take the um, rest 50 percent and you keep the final payment as between 40 to 50 percent at the end this is what i was doing now but um i think 50 25 is and again 25 is also a good idea depends on how again i feel it depends on the client because some people are happy to just pay you 50 percent of the advance up front but some think that you will run away with their money because it's a remote job and they are not really trustworthy of you, you know? So they are like, no, I cannot pay you 50%. What if you don't show up tomorrow? So I keep myself flowing and I say, okay, if you cannot pay 50, just pay 20, 25% so that I can start with an assurance as a both way street. It's a two way trust. I always say to my clients, it's not only one way you trusting me or me trusting you. We have to trust each other, right? Because it's a remote job. We are not meeting every day. So I think maybe 25, 50, and then rest of the 25 in the end. So however it flows for the people. But I think maybe 50, 25, 25 is a very good idea if people agree to it, yes. Definitely, definitely. Always 50%. That's standard rule. That's industry practice right there. That's just across the board on the industry. Uh, but one thing like you hit on, which is really important is building that trust with the client. You know, True. you want to get the client to trust you because they are handing you money, you True. know? So, you know, one way to earn that trust is with a well laid out contract. Indeed. You know, it shows more, it, it's to protect both of you, you know, and like the way a contract should be written is I, I present it and write it in a way that's for both of us. You know, like what the contract does is it gives clear expectations on what we're both going to get. Yeah, sure. Yeah, with time, I'm sure it's going to get better and better. I mean, oh, it, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, look, it took me years to get to that point. And then my first contract was like a paragraph. You know, that was my first contract. And the second contract was two paragraphs. 
Yeah. And then every job that I did, we'd always, there'd be something we'd run into, a challenge, something I wish we addressed first, like the no refund. And what I started doing was making a list in my Evernote. I started making a list like an add to contract list. So mm -hmm. I started adding stuff to that. You know, as issues came up, like, oh, we have this issue, let's put it to this list. So the next job I did, I would add it. And then I finally just went and bought a contract. I bought a template. <laughs> that sounds nice in the end. <laughs> yeah, I bought a template. I had the link on there. You know, I use this template now and it covers everything. It covers uh, the intellectual property. I don't even have to do anything. I just write the name, date, and order number on it. Okay. You know, and, and then in the contract, I just put down the scope of work, the timeline, and the pricing and the payments. It's, it's, a, it's a learning process, and I'm sure a year from now, our contracts will be even better, you know? For sure. As of now, I don't have one, but I'm looking forward for the upcoming clients so to make things easier for everyone involved, yes. <laughs> gotcha, man, gotcha. All right, so the next one, though, too. So before a contract, let me go ahead and hit share again real quick. So I'm not the only one looking at the slide. Let me see here. So before we even write a contract, we do a proposal. And I like to look at proposals as like the pre-contract right there. And it kind of, it works into the flow. And I guess I should have <clears throat> started now that I'm thinking about, you know, I made this slide really fast, but I probably should have added this before contracts right here because in our flow, whenever we're onboarding a new client, it always starts off, you get, you know, you, you talk to the new client, you do your, your introduction discovery uh, meeting, get to learn about what they want, how you can help them. Then the next step is writing proposals. And then after the proposal, you go on to the contract. So the first step after the step after you talk to the client, you know, like, you know, you meet the client, you guys have your call, either you're meeting in person or you're talking over Skype. And you're asking all of your questions. You're trying to find out about the project. And you're getting an idea of what exactly you're going to do for the project. So after you get all the information that you need from the client, you're going to need to write a proposal. Now, in the proposal, the first time we started writing proposals, well, actually, it was just like contracts. You know, my first year, I never wrote proposals. I sent an email to a client. And I would say, yeah, this job will be, you know, X amount of money. It will take me X amount of time. And that was it. You know, that's all I did for, I never did a proposal. And I found out that doing proposals, you know, um, it makes that communication so much clearer. Not only does it help you get the job, not only will it help you to make more money and to charge more money on it, but it's just like, just like what we're talking about with the contract, with the le a well laid out contract, you know, it, it gives more trust. It shows more expectations, you know, gives a clear idea of expectations. And the proposal, a well put together proposal, you know, it'll show your process. It'll let the client know exactly what to expect from you and how you're gonna work on it. It'll break down the prices and payments. So before you even get to the contract and talk about the prices and payments, it's already in the proposal so they know what to expect. They get a detail of the scope and the project outline, exactly what you will be doing for them. <clears throat> we put in our step-by-step -step exactly what we're gonna do inside there. And we're being as detailed as possible using bullet points so they know exactly what goes on. You know, and making it clear and easy to understand. This right here is gonna prevent so much problems. It is gonna save you from scope creep. And it's gonna make it a lot easier uh, just onboarding the client with a clear understanding of the job and what you're going to do. Uh, you know, this is the opportunity right here as well to find out what the client really wants in there. Like if the client needs to add more, you know, if they have different ideas, maybe your, your first call might not have been on the same page. Maybe there's a misunderstanding, but this proposal, you know, this is where you really get the communication open and, you start to agree. So it's kind of like a pre-contract, you know? So this way the client gets a chance to add to it, 
gets a chance to remove it. They get a chance to ask questions. So by making this as detailed as possible, you know, this is what's going to go into the contract. You get an agreement on the proposal. You just kind of transfer this over to your contract right there. You know, so before we go past uh, the proposals, I really feel this is another thing that would take a really big deep dive into. Because I can tell you right now, our proposal started off with none. Then it started off with a simple email. Then it started off with just a little one page Word doc. But our proposals today are about an average between 12 to 18 page PDF that we put together. That's how deep and detailed that we get our proposals. There's just so much to put in there. You know, your proposals where you're also going to build a lot of trust and where you're going to establish yourself as more than just a freelancer that's new doing this. You know, you put together a well put together proposal. It has like an opening page on it. You know, it has like a welcoming. This is what we're going to do for your business, your goals of your project. You know, it has a page on there that just shows exact your capabilities. This is what we can do, and this is how we can help you. You know, you have a page in there that shows some of your testimonials on there, some of your past projects. Then you have a page in there that goes through, you know, the, the scope of work. This is what we're proposing to do for you, you know. Uh, just an example, like in our proposals, if, say, we do a lot of design and we do mock-ups in our designs, so let's say uh, for our proposal, we're going to do a custom design and we're going to, we're going to design a homepage, a landing page and desktop and mobile. We're going to do two revisions for X amount of dollars. We'll let them know, okay, this is what you're going to get. If you want more revisions, it'll cost an additional amount of dollars on there. You know, making this as detailed as possible, you know, letting them know the prices on everything. Um, so, I'm really looking forward to doing a proposals call. I think like this, this helped me charge a whole lot more money. Like I could double my prices because I could show more what I could do with clients and it helps me close bigger jobs. Cause I'm telling you right now that if you're going after a bigger client and if they're calling up agencies that they're getting out of, you know, just doing Google searches, they're going to be getting proposals. And if you really want to bid with those other clients and you want a chance, at winning that job, you got to make a proposal and you got to give them the expectations that, you know, they're getting from other people as well. So real quick, does anybody have questions on proposals? Nah, don't throw on. All right, cool. We'll just go ahead and move along. All right. So the next one is collecting payments and, uh, Deposits, we do 50% always up front, no negotiations on it. We don't bend at all about it. I have bent before about it, and I could tell you that my experience is when a client is hesitant to give me a deposit, when they're trying to give me less than a deposit, they are always going to be difficult collecting money from. It's going to be difficult, you know. Everybody charges 50%, that's industry standards. Another one is achievable milestones. So breaking it down into sections, you know, just like uh, uh, that was, you know, suggestion was given was, you know, if it's a five page website, after three pages, you pay this amount, after this, you pay this, after you pay this. Just make it achievable and understandable so you know when you hit that mark. Uh, then final delivery, after all payments are made and the agreement is completed, um, we never turn over everything until the, the, all the payments are given. It's still ours until that very last payment. After all payments are given, we turn everything over to the client. Now, one good way to deal with a client, I've had this happen before where, you know, clients are like, can you just make our website go live? We need a live right now. Our business is going to go down if our website isn't live right now. I'm like, where's my payment at? You know, it's a, well, we don't say it like that. I just say, yeah, sure, if you could go ahead and send me a payment. It's going to take us time, but we need a live right now, you know, and they're being really pushy. Uh, what I found is just keep your cool. Keep your cool with it, you know. Stand your ground. Don't don't be, like, be positive about it. Like, one of the things that we, like, the way that I like to phrase our clients is, like, sure, we'll be glad to go ahead and put your site live. We're preparing it, getting ready. Just please send through the final payment. As soon as that payment hits, 
We're going to be really happy to launch your site and go live, turn over all over documents and everything. And uh, use invoices and invoice receipts on everything. And let's go ahead and open it up to Q&A. I know we're kind of already running a little bit late, so we'll just fly through this. Does anybody want to add anything to the call? <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. I just noticed the time right now. And I didn't realize it was already going this long. No wonder my throat is hurting. All right. Uh, I maybe have a question, but I'll, I'll do that later, maybe, after, after you finish everything. Jeff. All right. All right. Whenever you want to ask a question, go for it. Step in. You know, it's all good. All right, so the last one we're gonna hit on is choosing your prices, how to determine your value. Uh, and this is a tricky one, especially if you're new. I didn't know, like, what do I give myself? How much, how much do I charge an hour? It's crazy, like, I have to choose my own price. So how do you do that? You know, and you start off by asking yourself, you know, what kind of value do you really offer the clients? What can you really give them and how can you help their business? You know, what makes you worth more than, you know, a developer that's going to build an e-commerce website for a hundred bucks on Fiverr? And, you know, how can you offer more value? If you're trying to figure out how to make more money, how to charge more, it all comes down to the value that you can offer someone. How can you really help their business? And that's what you really need to look down deep inside. You know, um, the more you could do, to help somebody's business and to help them grow their business is the more you could charge and is the more that you're worth. You know, you're gonna, as you go through your journey, you're gonna start to get that self-worth. You're gonna start to see, you know, you're gonna start to see the impact that your work does. There's nothing like when you build a site for a client and you get the results for it. You're gonna start seeing those results. When you see those results are helping the client out, you know that you're starting to provide value. So just go from there, it's a journey. I can't really say how much you're worth. You know, this is something that comes from within. You know, something I had to figure out from within. I started off low because I didn't really have that confidence when I started off. I didn't really understand, you know, like I, I didn't know, you know, so I didn't want to start off high because I didn't want to take money from people. And I didn't want to feel like I was ripping people off, you know, so I didn't start off high. And, you know, uh, I also, for a long time, I went too low for a very long time because I didn't realize my assets, you know, it, it's, it's part skills for sure. You know, like what kind of technical skills that you have, there's other assets that you can bring to the table. You know, one of them is the communication, the dependability, the reliability, the communication. One of the common, uh, one of the common problems that I've heard my clients talk about was how they hired another developer and they disappeared. How they hired another developer and they did what they did not want them to do, so they had to hire somebody else. That they hired another developer and they just messed up everything and now they're just stuck with something. You know, and I saw that was one of our clients, you know, my client's biggest problems. And one of the things that I brought to clients before I got good at building websites, before I got good at design, one of the assets I brought to them was a genuine care, was reliability and being there for them, was answering late night calls, jumping on and fixing a problem if it meant their site went down. <clears throat> I don't, I still do it to this day. You know, I got calls over Christmas, late at night from a client who has an e-commerce website is in a critical period of her sales. This is like when sales are going on. I got a call, it was like 2 a.m. I jumped up, I turned on my computer, I went in to fix it because the client was losing money. I did not want the client losing money. And that's another kind of value that I bring to the table. So, you know, when you're trying to like ask yourself, you know, like how much should I charge? Look at the actual value, you know, are you willing to do that? You know, are you willing to do the communications? Are you willing to do the Skype calls and like, you know, really help out more with the research? Are you willing to actually look into the competition and like, you know, take those extra steps, you know, how much value 
can you offer the client? It's hard being new when you start off because you're still learning the technical side. You're still learning how to develop the skills and you're still learning on, on how to manage, you know, your business, your clients and the projects, but you're going to start seeing these things go on. I think, uh, the biggest part in this is it's easy to see the challenges and it's easy to see like, you know, the headaches. It's easy to see like the client horror stories, you know, the nightmare stories. It's easy to see that stuff. It's easy for me to like get down on myself because, you know, like I'm not as good as this over here. A very important part I feel of this is being able to take that time to look at your assets and what you're good at and constantly also looking at that and improve those. You know, that's the reason why inside this group that I want to stay doing, you know, the weekly goals and also your weekly accomplishments. I think it's so important to look at the accomplishments, not just what goals, you know, you said in the week you didn't hit, but what did you hit? You know, it might be something outside of those goals, you know, one of your accomplishments of the week. It could just, you know, it might not even be with work. You know, it's really important to look at those as well, because, uh, you know, for, for me, for a couple years, I was giving a value to clients and I wasn't really recognizing it inside myself. But when you start to change and look at the value of what you offer, that's when you really are looking at, you know, what you could charge and what you're worth and what you could offer. And the last part, giving yourself a raise. How do you give a raise? I think I'm going to leave this up to Lauren because, you know, she, she's uh, given herself quite a few good raises. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot like that, but uh, I, I'm not on, on the real. I think, like, you could really help out with this one right here. So that's it for the slides. I'm just going to go ahead and open it up. One thing I would like to add, Jeff, to what you're saying um, about valuing yourself. Uh, I think one of the best pieces of advice I got was when you get that email or that phone call from that client, do you feel angry? Do you feel excited to help them? Um, because if you feel like frustrated or scared or you're like, oh, this client again, you're not charging enough. Whereas it's like you said, like, I should feel that like, oh yeah, let's get this fixed. Let's, let's get this done. That's the, what I want to feel with all my clients. But when you feel underappreciated, when you don't feel like you're charging enough, it usually seeps into how you feel with your clients. That's so true. So true. I heard somebody say that too, not too long ago. They said like, if you're getting upset with your client, it's because you're not charging them enough. And I had to take a look at myself for a minute. You know, when a client starts asking me for all these things, start taking up all my time and starts frustrating me, it's because it's taking all my time and I'm not making enough on it. You know, why? And it's always, that's the answer. Time, time to raise prices again. <laughs> <laughs> Giving yourself a raise. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, I'd love to ask about uh, the, the hourly base and also the project base, actually. Um, yeah, you actually answered half of my question from saying that how we, what kind of value that we bring to us uh, so we can price them right. Uh, but in reality, we usually use cost base for the uh, for our pricing, it either in hourly or in project. So maybe can maybe you can share how can we decide on the hourly price and also the project price, and then also like uh, I don't want to feel like we are a bit higher than the market price, but if we are in the same market price people will start to see like, oh, you are in this price, then maybe what is the difference between you and this guy if the price is almost the same? I don't know. Did I make it clear? Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> no, clear, it's, but it's like two, two different questions. So the first one, uh, well, first let me ask like, what do you mean by uh, cost-based pricing? 
to clarify? Uh, a cost-based pricing is basically uh, like, I can say, your electricity, your device, your time, your internet, that's a cost base. So we decide, uh, no, it's more like uh, each device have its durability. Let's say for one laptop, it might last for three years. Mm -hmm. So if we divide it smaller and smaller and smaller, you can say like, oh, maybe for a MacBook, it's uh, the cost for one day, maybe like around $2, $3, kind of that. Oh, okay. So, and then also like, let's say you are working not in house because you don't have a good internet then you have to go to the coffee shop. It's a cost that you have to do, uh, you have to go out and spend some money in there. And also like, uh, if you are using plugins, if you are using sketch, you're using Adobe, that's a cost. Okay. So you're talking about like the expenses versus, you know, what you're actually getting paid for, how to factor that in. Right. I, I usually, uh, I mean, all this time I learned about finance. We usually use cost base to decide how much we price ourselves. This is not about the agency, but I, in general, I mean, like, uh, let's say you're producing a, a glass from a bottle, then you have to cut it how much you, you spend for the electricity, how much you spend for the sandpaper, kind of that. It's okay. easy to decide that, but in our case, because we are a service, it's a little bit hard for me to, to decide what is the variable for that. Yeah, it, it's, well, I'm not a finance guy, so it's like hard for me to put a number on that one, you know, and I think like having a, a definite number would be super helpful. But I do understand what you're saying because, you know, like we pay thousands of dollars a year on licenses, whether it's Sketch, whether it's, you know, Elementor, all the plugins we use and all the tools that we use, you know, our expenses, I do have our expenses per month that we have on it. And I factored that in, in the pricing. So <clears throat> say like, you know, like this is how I price. I'm just going to like say how I price. Cause I don't do all the development myself anymore. You know, now I work with other developers, other designers. So first what I'm going to do is see how much it's going to cost for me to build. And then I'm also say like, okay, all right, I don't want to steer too far off of your question. Uh, let me see. So, for an example, somebody says, okay, we need this 10 page website done. I'm like, okay, it's going to cost me X amount of dollars to have a bill. And now it's also going to cost me X amount of dollars for all the software and licenses that we use on it. So we add in all that stuff. And then we basically add in the cost that I'm going to get on the profit side of it, you know, and I also got to factor in that's going to take my time for project management for revisions. And then I even add in a little bit more for changes, but I'm sorry. I don't know if that was a clear answer right there. I don't, I don't think it was a clear <laughs> answer at all. That's okay. Yeah, that's I okay. think I went too far off. No, no, no. I mean, that's actually kind of, I kind of got that. Uh, so maybe you can share like how much we usually mark it up. Like, let's say your cost is for the project base the cost for plugin, for everything, for the server, internet, you count your depreciation for the computer, and then it costs $1,000. Home uh, for doing a 10-page 10, a 10 website, how much are you going to mark it up? How much you will say the price? We usually mark up about three or $400. And that usually covers the plugins and themes and like whatever we need for it. I don't mm -hmm. consider my computer and all that stuff. Like that's, I've just never looked at it that way. You know, like uh, I, see. I look at like my computer and all my like gadgets that I buy, you know, as uh. <laughs> part of my investment in my business. But like what I'm gonna give as far as a deliverable to a client, since I am giving them a product that has licensed, you know, software inside of it, I factor in that cost. One thing I've never, that I don't do anymore is I don't ask clients to buy plugins. I don't ask them to buy themes. I don't, I take full control of everything because clients don't want to deal with that stuff. 
That's our job. That's my job. You know, I know about plugins. I know about themes. They don't, you know, so why am I going to ask them to do it? And then I just factor that into the cost and add that in. I do have them pay for it, but I upsell it. <laughs> it's like, oh, you want this advanced contact form? We can do that, but then we charge extra for. Yeah, um, uh, sounds good. One, one question here, though. Um, uh, the ideal way, Jeff, I agree with you, is to give them the total cost. But, you know, it also depends on sometimes the mindset, mindset of the customers. So do you think it's healthy if I tell them that, yes, I am going to invest into the plugins for you because it's not your job, but here is the breakage of the cost right away. This is the cost for the designs and this is the cost for the plugins which will be required to make it one step easier for them to understand that what are we investing money in or do you think it's the total cost we should tell them? And if they ask me the question, then I tell them, okay, $50 for Elementor Pro, $10 for Astra and something like that. What do you think is a better way? The total cost or the total cost in breakage, like this much for the plugins and this much for my designing skills. And that's where the story ends. Uh, in our proposal, we break down everything. I give yeah, them a clear it. cut on what they're paying for. You know, the design is going to cost this much. Development, software for doing yeah. SEO is this much. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Sounds good. as detailed as possible for sure in it. Yeah. I just meant exactly. that I don't like tell the client, go buy this and come back to me yeah. with it. You know, makes that's, no that's what it I makes mean. no sense. Yes. It makes no sense to buy because then they get into a lot of problems themselves that this, that, and you open a can of worms for yourself, you know, like um, now you are spending two hours just to help them sort that plugin and everything. So it's better to do it from our end but put the cost right there and make them aware of the cost so that it's not in gray. Hmm. Perfect. And, and Chris, you had another question. Uh, you asked, I believe it was uh, how to know when to charge somebody by hour and by project, right? Um, I think it's kind of like you get to, this is something you got to like kind of figure out when you're talking with the client and seeing what goes better for them, you know, depending on the job. Most jobs we do are by project, but our hourly prices are different too. You know, they're not all the same hourly prices. So say we got like this client and we got a big job, we charge them, you know, we factor in the size of their business, we factor in the scope, and we come up with uh, the right cost for the job. And then inside there we say ongoing work or additional work for under 20 hours, we could do hourly. I put a cap on it though. I don't say unlimited hourly work. I say for smaller tasks for under 20 hours will be X amount of dollars per hour. And then it also depends on the client. You know, If it's a smaller client, somebody we've had for a long time, that their budget isn't as big, they might pay less per hour, you know, because, but I, I do put a cap on it. I think though, to determine between charge them, you know, hourly or by project is, you know, what you really feel is going to work best between you and the client. What's going to work best for you. And then you had a third question. I don't, I don't remember what that one was. You threw in two questions at once. Oh, you're muted. No, he's Lord. good. Yeah, he's fine. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Uh, let me see here. Thank you. <laughs> you guys did Thank it. You. We, got, we got to video number two. Look yeah. here. Uh, this is just the beginning. I have a feeling it's going to take like. I think it's going to take probably around like four, five, six videos to really get the swing of it. I appreciate you guys, you know, being involved and sticking around, especially in these first ones, you know. I hope like, uh, well, the video quality, all this stuff is going to change. Like I'm definitely like in the process of looking how to improve it, to step it up. And I hope that this could be like an ongoing thing. I don't think it needs to go on as long though. I think we could probably shorten it up a bit you know but definitely i'm looking forward to everyone's feedback what could we do 
to improve this? You know, what do you feel we could do to make this better? Is it too long? Should we make them way shorter? Should we, you know, focus topics in another direction? And I'm also looking to have other people host these calls as well. You know, maybe even open topic discussions. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing where this goes. Yeah, sounds good. I think it's the early stages, so we will have a lot more ideas coming up in future. It's the second week, and uh, I do not see a lot of participants, only us three are common than the last week, but I feel every week coming on, it's going to be increasing the engagement. And um, I think, Jeff, it's a good idea to, uh, you know, let people kind of give a little bit of a... Um, host because you have a for example a choked throat today maybe lauren can take care of the call next week yeah. <laughs> yes. you're like, volunteering me for me <laughs> <laughs> no no i'm volunteering for everyone even you know whoever you think is a better idea because if it's a family deciding on things for their business then i think everybody can take charge if they are ready to take it and uh, my i personally feel with upcoming weeks it will get more informative and I think whatever you are deciding for now, Jeff, it's a good idea because for me as well, it's a new thing to step into, but I'm looking forward to be a part as much as possible in the future. And, uh, you know, yeah. all cheers to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm really glad to hear that. Thanks. That makes it all worth it. Yeah. To me, that, that right there makes all this worth it. You know? Yes. I'm really um, grateful for it. For sure. And uh, one thing I feel, um, and I could relate with me right now is, uh, the number of participants, we just have four people, right? But for me, as a person, I think if you are planting a seed in just one mind at a time, you are pretty much doing your job. So it doesn't really matter one, two, five or ten. I mean, if one person you are making a change, because I, you know, other than this, I also uh, do certain things. Um, uh, so, for example, I am a life coach for kids in here in India, right? So the idea is to only plant the seed in one person's mind. If you are doing it for one person, I think it does the job. You don't need hundreds of audience because then you can mess it up as well. You know, everybody talking, everybody questioning. <laughs> but if there are some people you are making a change in their minds, I think that's a good enough number to keep it forward and not be, you know, thinking that, oh, we don't have 10 people. I think two, three, four is also a very good number to plant the seeds. That's all. So keep Thanks. going. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm definitely uh, more focused on quality over quantity. Yes, indeed. Uh, definitely. You know, like my vision for the group is not to get it to like 10, 20,000 people. You know? Yeah. But that's not my goal for the group. You know, my goal for this group is to have like a community that works together. Like I'm really yes. looking to get like mentorship programs going on and getting, you know, like units and like, you know, actually working and getting involved because I know the more involved that, you know, like when I, the more involved I get in something, the more I get out of it. And if we have like 10,000 people, it's, you know, I'd rather see, you know, a few yeah. involved and getting something out of it. So, yes. And yeah, thanks. Yes, sure. That's really good to hear that. How do you guys feel about the time? Should we shorten it up? Uh, you are the leader right now. You decide what to do next. <laughs> All right, I got another slide. Should we open that up? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no way, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, everyone. I really appreciate this. It is the beginning. I have a feeling, though, man, uh, this is going to be something awesome. I'm looking forward yes, to seeing it. these pros. And next week as well. If you have any ideas for the next slide, please let me know. I'll start a poll. I want to hear back from everybody what they want to see, what could help them out. And, you know, if anybody wants to reach out to me uh, here, that's actually participant. Anybody just watching this video, you know, like just wants to reach out. I'm always available. You can DM me. I am going to respond back to everyone. I think from there, I think we're good to go. Yes. A quick question. Last question. Uh, where are you gonna i'm sure you're gonna upload a pdf but will you gonna be share the details where are you gonna upload it or how is the pdf gonna go about i'm still setting that up i'll probably have it done by next week but you okay. know like yeah so i'm gonna set it up like a link to like my site where you can go ahead and download it 
Perfect. Sounds yeah. good. And I got a question for everybody too before we get off. How did everybody do on this week's challenge? Did you guys all get a, pro, a portfolio piece done and ready? Gonna work on it pretty soon after listening to last week. <laughs> working on it, man. <laughs> Some clients to take care of and also the portfolio. But I feel everything happens at the right time. You know, there is nothing, no rush going on. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we Let's make it a two-week challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a one-week challenge. There is a rush, man. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, just keep in mind, like, I know taking care of clients is important, but portfolios are going to help you get the bigger clients and you know, For sure. the clients you want, you know. So yes, that's indeed. equally or even more important. Well, I don't know. I want to say more. I keep client care at the top of my list. All the time, but now I also have building my business up there with it. Perfect. Sounds good. Cool. I think on that note, I think we're good to go. Yeah. All right. I'm not good at goodbyes, everybody. So I'm just going to say uh, goodbye. And, you know, I'll see you guys again <laughs> next week. Thank you all. See you. Here. see you later. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day. Namaste. Uh, yes. <laughs> see you.